Good morning. Uh, welcome to the last day of Disability Awareness Week 2022. Uh, my name is Peter Santiago and I'm the Associate Director of Accessibility Services. Uh, we're the office on campus that supports students with disabilities. Before we begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from stolen land, land that was stolen and rightfully belongs to the Lenape people. It's my sincere hope that, some way, that there's some way that we as a society could find a way to make amends um, to the generations of indigenous peoples that have been displaced from their lands and worse. This year for Disability Awareness Week, we've chosen to focus on the whole person and the myriad of intersecting identities that are often overlooked in people with disabilities. So we've hosted panels, talks, screenings, and all presented by KCC students and staff and faculty. Uh, this afternoon, we have an off-campus speaker that's gonna be talking to us about intersectionality and disability, the lens of racism, transphobia, homophobia, and other marginalized identities in disability. Our hope is that this week's events will help to shape your perspective towards a strengths-based and holistic understanding of the identity of identities of people with disabilities. Our first event for today is hosted by the KCC Recreation Club, who will be presenting on why our fitness, parks, and recreation spaces aren't accessible. Uh, so Mimi, please uh, take us away. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Peter. My name is Mimi Fearley, and I'm an instructor in the Health, Physical, Education, and Recreation Department, and I'm the co-advisor for the KCC Recreation Club. Today, members of the club are being joined with some of our physical education students. The recreation club members are actually therapeutic recreation students. So I'd just like to introduce everyone that is on today as part of this panel discussion. Caroline Ciarello is the president of the recreation club, and she's also going to be moderating today's discussion. Chelsea Rivera is the treasurer of the recreation club. And joining both of them are physical education majors, Francesco Asta, Kevin McGurty, Brandon Laverty, Eddie Munoz, and Anthony Lowe, who is going to be sitting in my chair in a moment, so you'll get a chance to hear from him. So everyone was in a course last semester where they were looking at issues of ableist design, meaning design and sports and recreation and fitness environments that most typically are really geared for people that do very well in sports and athletics, people that have perfect bodies and perfect minds. But in the course, we started to look at how could these environments potentially become more accessible and more inclusive for everyone across the age span, uh, with different types of disabilities, different cultural orientations. And um, the students in the class went and looked at a variety of different facilities and organizations from parks to ice skating rinks to martial arts studios, movie theaters. And they're going to be talking today about their experiences. Just a plug for the Recreation Club, which Carolyn and Chelsea can um, join in with as well. I'll make sure that in the chat I put my email so anyone that is interested in joining the Recreation Club, one of the oldest clubs here on campus and one of the most active. They kept going all the way through, through the pandemic, uh, switching to virtual presentations both for the campus community as well as for some other neighboring organizations. So there's more than room for everybody who would like to participate. So Caroline, I'm going to turn the floor over to you now to begin today's discussion of discovery. So take it away, Caroline. Hi. Um, so first let's talk about this, the sites that we, that we chose, well, that, that you guys chose. And if, if you found any accessibility fe features on it, were they in it? Did they hide anything? So let's talk about that first. Does anyone want to start to talk about this site? Yeah, I can start. Mm -hmm. um, I visited Marine Park in Brooklyn. 
and some of the accessibility features that I saw were they had a lot of ramps where the, everywhere there was stairs at, so they would make it easy for someone that couldn't wasn't able to walk up the stairs. Um, they had buttons on the bathrooms so that they would open up without having to pull it if someone wasn't able to. Um, they had like dips in curbs so that people could get into other areas, if that makes sense, like little pathways. Um, I think that's about it as far as accessibility went. Okay, thank you. Somebody else want to share? Yeah, I'll go. I'll do mine. It's a, I visited Brooklyn Bridge Park and I've been going there for a while now. So you could, I could arguably say I learned something new. I learned something new about that park every day that I go. It's, there's no handicap accessibility. There's no ramps. All the turf fields have little steps to them. The bathrooms are arguably pretty far from the actual soccer fields. When I had to use bathroom one time, I couldn't even find it. It was at least like a five minute walk from the actual fields. And then when you enter the bathrooms, they're very small and very compact with no accessibility to them at all. And, and mostly there's no shaded areas. It's all open and there's nowhere to really sit if someone needed to sit while to watch people play. There's only bleachers, which aren't really accessible. I've seen people struggle to get on and off of them. So I feel like that should be, there should be much change regarding that aspect. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to talk later on about the changes, but um, but it's interesting how uh, like a park doesn't need so much more to be added on. Does someone else need want to talk about their site? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Brandon Laverty, and um, so I I did uh, my local gym, Harbor Fitness, which is also known as Brooklyn's Gym, you know, and uh, but. I gotta say they they have accommodations, but they're very, for lack of a better term, half-ass. Um, they have an, an entrance ramp that is, I mean, in terms of um, steepness, um, it meets requirements, but it is extremely narrow. So if you had a bigger chair, there's no way you're going to be able to enter the building um, unless somebody were to physically pick up your chair and carry it up the steps. And they also have a bathroom um, uh, that is wheelchair accessible, but it's not, um, it, it's really the staff bathroom. You know? So they would have to accommodate you. There's no sign for it. They would, you would have to go to the front desk, which is about maybe four and a half feet high, you know, and uh, ask them to let you into the bathroom. And uh, that is about it in terms of accommodations at Harbor Fitness. Thank you. Okay. Somebody else wants to speak or we can move I'll on to something. the next question. Okay. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Carol. Good seeing you. So good morning, everybody. Yeah, I took I went to um Aviator ice skating rink. And um I think I think what I, I had a I had to prep the most for is like what I was going to pick. So what I wound up picking is I sort of had the tools to, you know, from the class to, um, you know, figure out if things were 12 inches and, you know, one, one inch to one foot, you know, all, all the, the measurements and the 36 inches around and everything. So I took those things with, with me, but I think picking out the site was, was really important, you know, um, I, I didn't know what to expect when I went there. So what I did was I got out of my car and I acted like I had a disability, you know, some type of physical disability. Um, and I, I just went through the motions. Okay, this parking lot looks kind of, you know, rocky. You know, there's a nice little slope here. And I made notes of these things. Um, when I got in, it had a ramp. It was 36 inches. Um, and then, you know, all, all the bathrooms and entrance doors, you know, needed um, wheelchair. They were pull and push. So I made note of that. So I, I was making these notes as I went along from what I learned in class. And um, I think that that was the biggest thing, you know, picking, you know, what I didn't want to do and then, you know, figuring out, okay, let me give this thing a shot and then going through the motions as if I was uh, disabled. That was, uh, that was, that was pretty good. 
and that's probably about the best thing. Thanks. Okay. Um, oh, Chelsea, go. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that's okay. I did a Garibaldi playground in uh, Brooklyn, and the only thing that was really accessible was one mm. low-hanging swing. And um, on the actual play sets, there was like little steps. So if like someone was in a wheelchair could try to go on, they could like kind of like prop themselves up on there, but that was it. Okay. Good morning. Um, hi. Hi, good morning everyone. So the site I decided to choose was Planet Fitness. And those of you that work out and sign up for Planet Fitness, you would know the doors are very, very heavy to open. So a person that is with disabilities, they would have a really hard time opening a glass door. It's so heavy. And oftentimes to transfer between the floors, you have to use the stairs. People on work, wheelchairs, they can't really use the equipment or anything. And in fact, most equipment at that gym can't be used by people that are disabled with their limbs and stuff like that. And there's only realistically only one machine that people can use and it's the cable machine, but otherwise every other machine and stuff like that, excluding dumbbells, it does not support people with disabilities. And the elevator is usually very small as well. Over is small, the place is cramped, the locker rooms are very tight as well, and the bathroom is not accessible by them, by, by them. it's usually too high. It's, it's above your waist, so people that are sitting on the wheelchair, they can't really wash their hands either or things like that as well. So there's like a lot of problems with Planet Fitness as a commercial gym that's available for everyone to sign up for and go to. Yeah, like imagine paying a membership for just one um one machine. So yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, before I move on to the second question, I think we should talk about how um why we think these places aren't as that accessible. Um, in like in regard to design, like even though um in this class we learned about the the Accessibility Act and the five hundred five and so on. Does somebody want to talk about? why they think um, these places aren't accessible. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, my location, which is the gym Harbor Fitness uh, was constructed in 1990. I feel that uh, just that that time has a lot to do with it. You know, I, I feel maybe there was still a lot of ignorance around the thought of, you know, those who are wheelchair bound or, um, you know, maybe just uh, those who don't have the mobility an able body has um, would think to go to the gym. You know, I, I guess they figured that was just out of the question and why put, and you know, this, is, and this was their first location, mind you. So I feel like maybe they were low on funds where it's like, we're gonna cut costs at every, <laughs> at every corner because we, we just simply don't have it. And, um, and now I feel now that they're saying, well, we have a good thing. It's successful. It works. Why change it? So um, I feel that uh, may have a lot to do with it. No. But, um, so there was um, the actual date of when the Accessibility Act um, was passed. Let me just open that up. It was in 1990, so that's recently. <laughs> like, uh, like I think that's um very, that's kind of recent though. Like, that's not been a long time. Like, what happened way before when this act passed? Like, so okay. So I think now we can talk about um. Were you able to talk with staff? Um, what were the responses? Like how they respond? Um, were they proud? Like, oh yeah, we have these, um, we have these programs. <laughs> I wanna ask this question, especially to Kevin, like I've seen his face. <laughs> so I think um, he can start this one now. Kevin, what was your response <laughs> when you talk with well, the staff? 
<laughs> well, first, first of all, first I looked at the uh, physical layout of the place, you know, and I made notes of that. Mm -hmm. For instance, the desk was three feet high, which, you know, all that stuff is good. Um, but, I, I mean, as you can see by looking at me, I'm, I'm 59 years old. And uh, so when I said I was a student <laughs> and I'm doing a project for, you know, for my college class, the guy was super skeptical, you know, he was like, you know, what are you from the government? And uh, what do you really want? You know, I started taking measurements. So he, he, he kind of limited to, he limited me to what I could do. And lucky I actually had my girlfriend with me. She's a little more convincing. She's a little, you know, she just um, knows the right way to talk to somebody. So he, he, he let us in, but really restricted. He followed us around and I'm not sure what, the government really cares about a uh, ice skating rink, but you no, know, I think he was afraid that uh, you know there might be fines because not everything was um, up to you know the I, the Disability Act, you know. So uh, you know, and I told him, listen, no one's going to come here. <laughs> you know, there's not going to be any government uh, thing, and you know, he sort of took my word for it, but he he did let me um, measure stuff. Um, and he just kept it limited and restricted, but I took a lot of quick pitches and um, and a lot of quick measurements. But yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> it was interesting how it's more credible for uh, somewhere from the government or the FBI um, to right. check out the accessibility of a place, right? So, <laughs> like in the middle of nowhere. So it's in the middle of nowhere. Know. Like, yeah, I mean, like people don't like they assume that people don't um, not look up these things or don't really um, right. ask for them. So yeah. anyone else, did someone, was, was someone else able to speak with staff? <clears throat> Sorry, um, to, and, was, and what were the responses of the staff? Uh, yeah, I could say something on that. I, I would walk around and I asked a lot of the workers there that were like cleaning and just over around like observing the area and they wouldn't give me a response of to like why there was no ramps or, and when you ask them why, they really just like give you a shoulder shrug and they're just like, you could uh, like go to their website or X a uh, higher up. But then when you ask them to the higher up, they're like, oh, I don't really know. Like they're just really there to, to work. They don't really know why they're doing what they're doing. So it, it really didn't provide any help to me. So I just that's why I had to take it upon myself and just like look around, walk around and see if there's anything accessible there. But whenever you ask them, they just you know, just give you a shrug and then they just keep doing what they're doing. It's the same for Planet Fitness as well. Uh, exactly what Francesco said. People just go there just to work and most people that go there and work, they probably just like to work out and they don't really know anything about accessibility, honestly. And every single time you go there, people working there are not even like the same consistent people either. Like Francesco really said, it's just everyone just knows nothing. And then they'll just direct you to their website and then you probably won't even find anything on their website for sometimes and it's just not useful yeah i see a comment from eric it says the ada could certainly use um straightening i understand the public um tran transit isn't the main topic here but it's still a huge issue um yeah like uh, um i didn't notice before like before the assignment, like every time, like you're in the metro and then they say, um, and the accessible ramps are at the end of the, at the end of the rail. So that's, those are things that you notice. Um, or in the application, like you can see which buses come and actually kneel down and, and um, put this ramp so like you can get inside the bus. But um, what happens to me is that, um, like I see people rolling their eyes every time a bus stops and use use the rail, and I'll like I'll just look at them. I'll I'll look at them like, and if they have the audacity to say something, I'll be like, take a taxi. If you don't, if you you won't let anybody like inside the bus. Like, I it's not just um I think it's everybody, um like since the society since um since who it's. It's n we can't just blame this certain site. Oh, like Planet Fitness is um, well, Planet Fitness is is basically a gym, and yes, it does need to be more accessible. But also, the people like have to be mindful of that 
there needs to be changes done. So I see more comments here. Um, the ADA needs reinforcement. Yes. So. Mm. I think that was a great point that you had with the people and their like uh, feelings towards accessibility and like having to wait for people to get on. I think people have a hard time like putting it into perspective. Like if you had a disability and you needed the bus to lean, you wouldn't want people like rolling their eyes and getting annoyed at you for having to like use something that's there for you to use in the first place. I think that was a good point that you had there. Yeah, I, I think this class, at least I'll speak for myself, open, opens your eyes, right, Eddie? You know, to like, um, I don't know, just everything around you, man. And, and you know, they chose certain stations to have um, elevators and stuff. And what about the other people? <laughs> you know, how, how do they, I, I know they probably possibly, they can't possibly put a, a elevator in every station, but it's, I think it's got to be, thought about a little more and I don't want to get too far off the recreation track sorry but it's it's relative you know no it's okay we're here to um share our opinions and like the flow of the conversation what are our thoughts about um about accessibility here in our society so um I think now it's a time to share about what improvements we want to do about our site in, the, in the specific. Does anyone want to share? Like now that we know there's a problem, what can we do for it? So does anyone want to share that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for my site, right, um, uh, let's start with the entrance way. You know, the, the ramp would be have to be widened um, and then as uh, Anthony said, you know, the doors, you know, to open this door in, in a wheelchair, this is, this is, uh, you know, um, an issue. And, and uh, this gym is, is two floors, you know, and, and not to mention uh, half of the first floor has a set of steps that leads to the other half of the floor, <laughs> you know, there's, there's no ramp there. So this, this um, just starting with the first floor, you would need to either level the whole uh, equipment floor or you would have to add a ramp. And um, let me see, you would have to have elevators that would lead to, um, they have a, uh, like this little room, I call it like floor 1.5, you know, and then you have the second floor. So you would have to, you know, construct the elevator that could reach these two levels. And then um, you would have to uh, re redesign the whole bathroom. There is, it's a very narrow, narrow hallway that, you know, cannot be navigated with the wheelchair. And um, not to mention there's, there's no, um, there's no wheelchair friendly stalls, no wheelchair friendly showers, saunas, steam rooms, this, it, it, but it's, it's New York City. You know, I, I try to, Everybody tries to um, do as much as they can with as little space as possible. And, and like I said, this building is so flawed because, you know, it was built. Uh, this whole gym was constructed 30 years ago. So I, I try to keep that in mind. And just, you know, because uh, with our projects, we, we had, a, um, you know, an infinite amount of money. So... <laughs> Uh, in order to really um, make Harbor Fitness wheelchair or, you know, um, you know, uh, accessible to all, it, it would be a dramatic construction, really. Uh, and not to mention the machines. You know, actually, I pulled it up. I, I, I pulled up my slides and they have this machine. It's, hold on, I got the name right here. It's absolutely incredible. It's called the, wheel, the wheelchair fitness solution. Those who are not familiar with it, I suggest you just Google it. It was designed by uh, Mike Arez. And this allows um, someone who is wheelchair bound um, to hit every major muscle group in the upper body, you know, um, from uh, lat pull downs for the back, uh, you know, uh, a cable uh, press for the chest, 
Uh, you could also do some rope crunches for your abs, cable curls for the biceps, uh, lateral raises for the shoulders, and even provides um, a setup so you could get on a dip bar and a pull-up bar and also has a rope climb, an arm cycle. I mean, this, this machine is incredible. And I think it takes up may maybe, if I had to say, it's about 15 by 15 in, um, uh, in terms of space, 15 feet by 15 feet, if I had to say. And, you know, it's maybe as high as uh, your, your average uh, lat pull down life fitness setup, which is maybe 10 feet high, you know, it really wouldn't take up much space. And, um, and even, uh, you know, if, uh, let's say a bunch of machines are taken, even an able body could, uh, could use this machine, you know? Um, so, uh, and, and if I had to say, maybe if, if I had to say it probably cost about $20,000, the, the, the average cost of like, um, most, uh, life fitness, um, pulley equipments. So, um, yeah. And, uh, and that's about it, you know, but yeah, so all the doors would have to have, uh, I, I can't, can't get over it. Cause like I said, when Anthony said it, I struggle with the doors myself in, uh, in this gym. So I can only imagine, you know, but thank you. Okay. Thank you, Brandon. Um, somebody else wants to talk about the accessibility features they did. Um, I remember that, for example, Chelsea, she did um, a park, but there wasn't only accessibility, um, such as um, wheelchair features. Um, she did something with, because it's a park um, for children who have autism and sensory, so make, make it more sensory friendly. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Chelsea, can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, one of the things I want to add was um, to have like a weekly program possibly with, for things like um, like bring instruments like a xylophone or like something like when you press it changes cut like it changes colors and also like just like different textures and like the, to walk on which would be more for um, people with you know it'd be for like everyone but also like more focused on people who have autism and ADHD and um, some of the other things I wanted for it was uh, a more like a swing where someone could put their wheelchair on it their whole like their whole wheelchair so they could be able to swing on it because at, at that park what the kids do with the with the low hanging one is throw it over the bar to make it like normal or higher so it'd be like kind of a struggle for someone who's in a wheelchair to try to use it. And um, another thing is uh, for to put ramps on the actual play playgrounds. I, um, I remember when I was younger, there was a child who had, um, who, who was in a wheelchair and they did, the only thing they could do is, was crawl around on, on the play set. And there was just like a whole bunch of kids running around and her sister was trying to like, block like kind of like block her for from any of the kids running so um yeah I think like that would be like some important features for that park okay thank you Chelsea um somebody else want to share yeah I could talk if you like you know um the, yeah there were two aspects for me so there was the um the physical layout you know and seeing if that met the standards seeing what we could add and you know, for me, where, you know, like Brendan said that, you know, we get this abundance amount of money. So, you know, the more I looked into um, um, skating and what they do, I mean, you know, there's, there's skating for the blind, there's skating for, uh, for blind people, there's skating for, you know, the um, hearing impaired. Um, they have a para, para, paralegic uh, skating and this equipment costs a ton, you know, and, and I, I put on you know, I, just to give everybody an idea, you know, when I looked into each site, right, and I made note of what it would need and the coaching and the staff and um, just to give them an idea, a puck alone was like just one puck for a hockey game was like $50. So, um, you know, get creative and, and 
keep it human. I mean, that's that's what I was trying to do. You know, get the you spend the money on the human aspect. You know, have good coaching, have a good staff, and um, that's it. You know, that's uh, that's that's pretty much how my my project came about. So, um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think we're ready now to talk about um, how did this assignment change your perspective? Um, like the before and after, what were your thoughts? Like after you did the assignment, what changed in your perspective? Does anyone want to share? Mm, sure, I could share. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, I really didn't notice when I first went that there was nothing accessible in Brooklyn Bridge Park because I just never actually looked around and took notice. I would just go play for my league and then just leave but then i as i was doing this i noticed that there was nobody that like needed a wheelchair or like with a disability that was there nobody was there like it, i maybe saw one in the span of like three months of summer and they were just sitting all the way on the outside behind the netting like they couldn't be physically on the field and enjoying like the area with everybody else so and then let me think why if parks are open to everybody why can't everybody enjoy it so like that's really what changed my my perspective of the whole park. Okay, somebody else wants to share? Yeah, I'll 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 share if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I, I would say the language. You know, um, you know, I grew up in a different era, and we 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 just just society talked with each other it wasn't as um um wasn't as polite i guess to to people with disabilities so that that was a big thing for me to, to learn the language you know now learning it and implementing it you know it's it's a process you know so i do the best i can you know and uh you know at least i'm aware of it you know and um yeah that was a big learn for me you know how to address uh, people with disabilities Yeah, and for example, most of us are going to be um, patient therapists or phys physical education teachers or sports management. Um, so how did this, could someone give me an example, like how did this course will help um, in the future? Like um, if you had, what accommodations will you, will you like to be made? Um, for example, inclusive programming, um, or even talk about the benefits of social functions of, of anything that you may apply in the future, like realistically, not not having like th this ton of money, like what, what can you do to make this um, a more accessible place? Well, for me, uh, uh, me, I wanna be a physical edu education instructor. So for me, I feel like you don't want one student to feel singled out because of their, what if they're in a wheelchair, they can't participate. For me, I want someone to feel, all right, you could do exactly what all the other kids are doing to your best of your ability. We're going to make you feel that you could do it as well. And that will help their social function of being like, I'm just like everybody else. There's no reason why I can't play this sport or do this activity just like the other students are doing. I want everybody to feel involved. Thank you. We need more. We need more. We need more of you, um, Francesco. Like, we... Um, if somebody else could, like, if we teach this to more people, like, this will be a better place, honestly. Um, Karen Fung, did I pronounce that right? Um, you want to speak? Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Hi. So, hi. I just wanted to add to what, uh, Francesco, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, like, clearly. But, like, yeah, I agree with what he was talking about, like, how to make the improvements. And I just want to say that, that, like, like we also need like social social connections with each other, like maintain like better social connections or networking with each other. Yeah, social connections. Um, in this assignment, we specifically talk about the physical things, but also the social are as as equally important. Um, like something that shocked me is that when I saw this documentary called Crip Camp, uh, they had separate, like the programming of the schools were separate for um, children with wheelchairs. They'll have them in another class. And even in the basement, if, if I'm 
like if I remember right, like even in the basement, uh, how, like, why didn't, why isn't, I love crew crap too, like, we could, we could do a whole panel discussion about it, um, but yeah, like, how, like, why schools made children with, who, who were in a wheelchair, um, take their class in the basement and not with the other students, like, that, and that's something that also needs to be changed, so, yeah, we all like Crip Cram. We all, like we want to talk about Crip Cram a little bit because it talks about um how how this all began to because it talks about the also the before and after um with disabilities. So. Or does someone want to talk about the programming that they? Um, Someone wants to add on to something? <laughs> I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I just took a second to look at the chat. Oh, you're muted, you're muted. I'm um, sorry. Um, about the benefits of social functions, we're still talk. we'll talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I like, well, what got me, excited was the more I looked into this online, right? Um, seeing, you know, the, there's so many things from surfing, you know, to skate parks, to um, uh, hi hiking in the Grand Canyon, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of social things that um, do go on for, you know, people with disabilities, but do is it advertised enough you know do they know about it you know um is it selective you know or or is it completely accessible for anybody you know whether the economics or anything like that um i mean that's that's the social aspect that i think uh needs to be expanded you know where um people have knowledge and, and know where to go you know to hook up with these things i mean it's 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 amazing what 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 they do have. I was getting addicted to the videos. I kept watching the next one or the next one. I was like, this is great, you know. So you know the, um, I think this the social gatherings are there. It's just I think people need to be be made uh, more aware of them, you know, and more more accessible to them. So that's what I think. Okay, I see in the chat that somebody asked that, speaking of pools, I'm curious how a disability accommodation pool looks like. Um, does someone want to answer that, through that question? Um, I know that like some, some of those pools, like they have like a, a ramp that goes into it with um, like a special wheelchair. And um, some other places have like, like, a kind of chair that like someone could sit on and then it, it they get lowered into the pool but that's all i know about that we okay. also learned about the pool that um the floor will rise and lower so that like the whole pool come up and it'll become smaller so that people can get in easier i forget what that was called You're muted. I'm sorry. Um, it says that KB KCC has a wheelchair lift pool currently under construction. And so I think we can talk now about um, how Kingsboro is get is accessible. For example, um, I take class in the S building. And for the people who don't know where the S building is way in the back. like over the, across the side, um, the entrance. So, and the, like the other day I was, I was walking there and I realized, well, this, this pavement is not steady. Like this is rocky and it's someone with a wheel, like KBCC does have um, like the, like the doors that open automatically, but why, why you have to go inside the building and to get outside the building, not, not be able to walk. Um, directly to a certain building. 
it says that the accessibility list has been there a long time. Pools itself is under construction. Yeah, I remember um, the first semester I was at Kingsborough, it was still under construction. It's been two years now, so I don't know when it's going to be done yet. So um, I think it's time to, because in this part of the discussion, there's going to be um, Dr. Sharon Caravello is going to talk about the KBCC farm and garden renovation. We like, um, it says the S building, the science building in the back that connects to the Mac building inside. Yeah, so yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, why you have to go inside, um, like inside to get to the other building instead of using the shortcut? Like, it's just things that you notice um, after making, taking courses like this. Caroline, I think, is this a good time for me to segue into some of what yes. we're doing at the farm? Okay, yes. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. So I'm Dr. Shannon Caravello. I'm uh, in health and phys ed. I'm a faculty member there. And I'm also the community farm and garden administrator. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. Bear with me just one moment. Okay, good. I think you can see that all. Fabulous. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the accessibility need that we have, uh, accommodation need that we have on the campus farm. Let's see, there we go. Okay, so let me just get this set up. So just quickly, why do I do this? Um, I love the farm. I've been teaching here for about almost about 15 years now. I went to the farm uh, to help supplement my income. Uh, I, as an adjunct, it, I was not always making a lot of money and that's just kind of how it goes for faculty members in some instances. So uh, I wanted to uh, raise my kids around the garden and farm. So I have been volunteering at the farm on and off for about 10 years now. I was also a CLT. I've done my doctoral field work uh, there as well, um, community farm and gardener as well, outside off, off campus. I'm also a Crohn's and Colitis Foundational National Advisory Task Force member, so I'm a Crohn's warrior. I have what you call an invisible disability. So uh, I really appreciate, Francesco, you starting off earlier talking about restrooms. That is a massive accommodation for folks with uh, inflammatory bowel disease and other, um, any digestive um, diseases. Uh, also, a lot of folks that we have that are, have invisible disabilities will be those with autoimmune diseases that you may not be able to see. And through the years, me being here, I have noticed a really large amount of students um, presenting with autoimmune diseases that have disclosed to me and talked to me. So it's something that I'm always on the lookout for to make sure that these students are also being accommodated because it's nice and easy to see if there's a wheelchair ramp or not. Um, or a wheelchair accessible bathroom, but that does not mean uh, that folks who have visible disabilities are the only ones that are really in need of that space. So gardening heals, it heals me. I love it, it helps me mentally, physically, and emotionally, especially when I'm dealing with Crohn's uh, and I am at my sickest, it is the place I love to be because it is good for me. So just, you know, KCC, the Community Farm and Garden has a lot of different things happening at it. I know a lot of you may not have been there yet since we're coming back from the pandemic, but really we have a wonderful uh, space, a quarter acre um, urban farm uh, that we have been. It was traditionally an urban farm and is now transitioning to a community gar gar uh, garden and farm, which now is allowing us to bring more folks into the space including small children, and has allowed us to now say it is time to do some ADA compliance in this space. For many years, um, we, and this is what it traditionally looks like when it is uh, at its, its glory. As you can see, uh, this is some of my past students in one of my classes that had come down into the space. Uh, this is wonderful if you are a completely able-bodied individual. If you have any issues walking on uneven paths, if you are in a wheelchair, if you have a walker, cane, or any uh, disabilities relating to uneven spaces and grounds, uh, this has been a space that you really have had issues uh, navigating or coming into. I personally have had students not be able to come into the space while I was teaching a class in the space. So that really um, had a profound effect on me throughout the years. So um, as you can see, this is you know a lot of right now that we're we're bringing the farm back, the farm and garden back because the weeds had taken over. And as you can see, there is no way uh, someone who is in a wheelchair or has any. Uh, disability mobility issues can get through this space right now. So we, um, as a group, had come up 
uh, discussing different ways that we can make this uh, space more accessible. So in terms of recommendations, each space it's gonna, it is going to have its own recommendations, whether it's a fitness facility, whether it's um, a park, um, any space where children are, are uh, included. And it's important that to know that you're not going to really be able to meet all the needs of everybody, but it's best to meet the needs of as many people as you possibly can and really understand the disabilities that are happening out there right now. Uh, and again, I mentioned visible disabilities. There's a lot of folks that are having issues in spaces that you don't even see because a lot of folks don't know about these disabilities that are happening. So in terms of what we looked at with the community farm and garden is that we wanted to make sure that for ADA compliance, the pathways are a minimum of 36 inches, which allows wheelchair access. Turning points when they, with any of the angles should be 60 inches across so that wheelchair can navigate in that small space. We wanna make sure that the pathways are clear of debris. If there's pavers that are put in, they need to have appropriate ADA compliant spacing. In other words, if there's pavers and the spaces between the pavers are too big, that can cause an issue for folks with either in wheelchairs, uh, with canes and walkers as well. Uh, hazardous material, clutter, nails, anything sticking out can be dangerous. Um, signage should be visible for people of all heights. Uh, raised characters or pictures on this, the signage can really help those who've experienced sight loss and also help folks understand the signs. If, if maybe they can't maybe they're not able to read or understand what's happening in the signs, but visual pictures can make a huge difference for that. Um, smaller, easy to handle water containers that are not very heavy because water containers, when you're watering, can get very heavy. Even the, the, um, the hoses can be very heavy and difficult to manage. Uh, ergonomic tools, variety of raised beds at different heights really makes a difference. And of course, uh, wheelchair accessible beds. So uh, in terms of sensory gardens, really important native plantings are always beautiful, New York related native plantings, which help support the pollinators in the area. And you wanna focus on hearing, sight, smell, touch, taste uh, for our neurodiverse individuals who come and visit the campus and come to the space. Shade, oh my gosh, shade is so important. Places to sit and rest and restroom access are big. We really need to have that. And as you all noted in your spaces, access to restrooms was not not really always available, not always appropriate availability. Um, there weren't always places to sit. And we know why they do this in New York. They do this in New York because they don't want homeless people sitting and setting up camp on a bench. And that is just ridiculous, as we all know. Um, and it just does not meet the needs of so many of our New Yorkers. The shade, there are autoimmune diseases that um, lead to photosensitivity and you're not even able to be in the sun. I mean, I've had some students that had severe situations with that and could not uncover. So we need to keep this in mind in any of these spaces that we have moving forward. So what we have done or what we're looking to do, we're in the process of waiting for renovations. Just so you know, things take time, uh, especially at CUNY, we're coming back from the pandemic and we're really trying to uh, really renovate a lot of areas in the campus. So it's taking a little longer than I would have liked, but. I'm gonna be patient because this, this process, if we can be patient for it, it will last us a very long time and meet the needs of many of our students mo moving forward. So this is an overhead view, and this would be the front of the um, farm space, farm and garden space. And these are our production beds. Now it's important to understand we are going to um, create ADA compliant spaces, but the entire farm will not be able to ma be made um, ADA compliant because as we have, uh, we increase space between the beds, we lose beds, and then we will lose production in terms of vegetable production, which will affect distribution later on. So there will be parts of the spa this space that will not be ADA compliant for pathways, uh, but a good portion of it will. So in particular, when you walk in, this is all concrete, stable ground. And what we are proposing to do is have a four foot wide pathway starting from the concrete all the way through and along the pathway, we're gonna have a variety of raised beds and wheelchair accessible beds uh, that are here. And then all this gray space that we're looking at is what we're looking to have either permeable pavers or concrete, either of those options would be great for ADA compliance. And so if a student, faculty, staff member, visitor would come in through the front of the gate, they would be able to navigate all the way through, um, see within the, within the hoop house, 
and then make it through back down here. We have uh, the farm shed. And I know it's a little difficult to envision this, so I invite you all to come down. We have our volunteer days that are coming up uh, starting on April 12th, so you're welcome to come down. And I would love to talk to you, about. I love talking about this. So if you want to come visit me during these volunteer days, and I'll show you exactly what we're planning on doing, I'd love to do that with you. And so we are going to also make sure in certain pa uh, places that the pathway is wide enough. So a student would be able to access, and we have a farm shed entrance into the T2 building here. So you would have full access across the entire space. And we're also looking to put in a pergola structure in the mid area here, which is a great place for uh, students and faculty to meet and have a conversation because we do have tours, we do have classes that come to the space and providing some shade would be wonderful. We also were going to put some shaded areas around um, and actually this has changed. The shade sale is actually now a tree that we put in, which I'll show you in just a moment. So lots of different things that we're having. This is one of the options we were talking about, permeable pavers here. This is something that we're looking at to have put into the space. And you can see, oh, the ADA compliance does now not allow anything larger. I want to say it's maybe about a quarter of an inch between the pavers. And uh, what we're looking to do is we're putting, instead of having wooden beds, which can present an issue with splinters for small children, we're going to have more small children in this space. Um, and you know, uh, we want to make it safe for them. And also just for anybody, uh, we're going to be doing biodegradable or compost, uh, not compostable, but uh, plant their, um, their recycled plastic boards that last for a very, very long time. And uh, they, you know, are used, they're made with recycled materials. So this is what we're looking to do. So they will be raised. This is just another um, version of, of some type of material that you could do with a raised bed. Um, this is a SUNY Downstate uh, Medical Center. We put in a, a garden over there. And this could be an option where like a wheelchair could pull up next to it and could garden sideways. There are lots of different ways that people can approach gardening with a wheelchair. Uh, this is, you can see the space would not be accessible enough for somebody to go through, but they're not expecting to have people in this space. It's a little bit different. I just wanted to show you what some of the products are that are out there. This is a wheelchair accessible bed that we're looking to uh, purchase for the space where a person could come in underneath the space and the gardening would be uh, just about at shoulder level, level, so it would be comfortable. And it has a smaller space and then a deeper space. So you can grow uh, lower, uh, not lower, but more shallow plants in the front and deeper plants in the back. Uh, this space here down here, this is proposed for the children's garden space in the front where you would have different levels of raised beds that would be modular and would be safe for the children. Uh, this is some examples of what we'd love to have in this space. This is with a shade sail, which could provide some space in the area. The pergola structure, it might end up being wood or metal, we're not quite sure. And this is um, an accolade cherry. Um, so it's basically a Japanese flowering cherry. You're going to see those all across campus. We planted them in the fall. We have seven at the farm, six outside the location and one in the, in the front of it. So they're just starting to bloom in their babies, but that's going to provide a, le a level of shade um, and beauty as well in the space and that's part of it is the relaxation the relaxation part of it the nurturing part of it the nature part of it is really important it's we're not just dealing with folks who may have disabilities we're also dealing with folks who come to these spaces for mental health relaxation really really important so um, this is just some other examples of benches this is a, an acoustic fence we're considering putting this around one one part of the farm to dampen the noise from a hvac system uh, we're not sure if that's going to happen because the wind tunnel is pretty crazy over there and it may not stay so we're, we're considering that uh, this is a type of vertical gardening here where you have uh, the planters raised along the fences and that also we're, we're considering if the wind is going to allow us to do that and just having maybe a couple of water features here and there uh, would be uh, really beautiful to, you know, allow for meditation spaces. And we have some folk faculty members who definitely want to do some yoga in this space. So we want to be able to facilitate that. Um, ergonomic tools, comfortable tools that you can, you know, help you reach and grab uh, that can reduce workload uh, that maybe have, you know, may have shorter or longer handles for different folks makes sense. Um, special grips for pruners that can alleviate for those with arthritis or any type of disability that affects hand grip strength. There's a, a whole bunch of different things that they sell for that. So this is something we're going to be looking into purchasing as well in the future. 
Another option that we're going to have is to uh, have some, uh, you know, growing uh, through hydroponics. And this could be something that could be inside the farm shed, not necessarily outside. So if we do have somebody who comes in and wants to be involved in growing in some way, but cannot necessarily be out in the sun or in the heat, this might be something that we can, um, we can work with. Um, so this is this is Rita. Rita Van Orr is a student of mine. She really years, many, many years ago, was one of my students who struggled coming into the space. And it's really important for us to make sure we accommodate those folks. So this was a volunteer day where Rita wanted to come and help out. Uh, and I wanted her to come and help out. And even though we were doing heavy weeding and stuff outside that she was not able to do, it's really important to make space for folks in, in a way that is accessible for them. So for Rita, I just, we made sure we make her comfortable. She comes in space and she does a massive amount of work. As long as you can accommodate folks, they can do a lot of work and enjoy it and get the benefits of it. And of course, anytime you're dealing with children, having, you know, things for them to do is really important. So this is my son. I brought him and I put him to work for volunteering. So uh, yeah, so we have, um, just so you know, if I'm going to put this in the uh, I'm going to put this in the chat. This is a link for a guide for gardening accessibility, uh, which is from a great organization up in Buffalo. I want to share that with you all in case you're considering doing that. And I uh, just set up the volunteer days. So you're welcome to come and join us in the space as we move forward with, um, you know, with every all these wonderful renovations that we're going to are going to be taking place. So yeah, so thank you. And I hope you uh, all can come down and see the, the space. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Hey, thank you for sharing. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm very impressed. Like, uh, well, um, like, just how it it looks like a lot, but it's it could benefit more than you. I think we can imagine. Um, because sometimes we'll be like, oh, like the shade is for someone who's um imo Um, I'm sorry. Uh, but but there are disabilities that people don't see. And for example, like a student can be stressed out and a student can go and relax. Like that's that's still part of the it's part of being in college. Like for example, yeah. I have rosacea and I'm not like, oh, like Well, Carolyn, oh, no. that's important to understand. We have a lot mm -hmm. of students that may have a chronic disease that are on certain kinds of medication, like I'm on a biologic, I cannot really be in the sun without having appropriate protection because it increases my risk of cancer. You know, we have a lot of students that may have, you know, lupus um, or uh, rheumatoid arthritis or photosensitivity, and we don't see that on them. And they also, you know, something, if you think about me with Crohn's and, and ulcerative colitis, I can't really explain to you in detail what's going on with me for you to explain, you know, understand because we're dealing with a sensitive matter because these are restroom issues and it's not appropriate to always talk about that. Although I like to work on destigmatizing that whole concept because I'm still a human. Some folks may have a stoma an ostomy that you can't see that requires them to have access to certain special sinks and bathrooms. And I actually have been denied access and I do fall under ADA compliance of, for restroom access. And I have been denied in very severe circumstances access to restrooms in New York. And we actually have a, a law, a, a Senate law signed in 2017 saying that they are not allowed to legally deny me access. And I've had that as well happened to me. And at one point I had the choice between using the restroom or picking up my child from school. And that was a terrible situation, you know, to decide on. And thankfully somebody was like, that's ridiculous. Go ahead. And they snuck me in to use the restroom. Uh, and so we need to, we need to educate and let other people know that folks are dealing with these situations. And we also need to advocate to have all our restrooms open on campus because we don't have that right now. And that could be a situation where a student may have some situation where they need a specialized restroom with a bathroom in the bathroom stall with them, not one that they have to do with, do what they need to do publicly in, in a public restroom with everybody. So yeah, that's my, uh, my level of advocacy on that. So thank you for letting me share my, you know, my situation with you all. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, Dr. Levine has her hand up. I want to share something. Yes. Hi everyone, and uh, it's so good to to hear all of you sharing. And I just want to say that uh, Shannon has really created a wonderful place for all at at the garden. 
as both a my turn student, a volunteer at the garden and farm, and a faculty member teaching chair yoga and now accessible yoga on a mat. Uh, I just want to say that Shannon and, and all the volunteers create a very warm, welcoming environment where everyone's contribution is appreciated. And uh, certainly as an older student, older faculty member, it's very important for me to feel appreciated that whatever I contribute is appreciated. And I have found a, a sanctuary, really a sanctuary at the garden. Um, and I, I had a heart attack five years ago. I'm fully recovered, but I need to work at my own pace. And I find that the physical work involved at the garden is very accessible for me because I can work at my own pace. And when I need to take a time out, I go in the shaded area, sit down, take a time out, have something to drink, and then go back and work. Um, there's no rigid time requirement. It's whatever time I'm able to give is appreciated. And uh, there's a lot of a lot of socializing that goes on as we work. So it's a very relaxed atmosphere, very social atmosphere where everyone's contribution is appreciated. So I just wanted to share what a joy it is to work in the garden. And Shannon, you have just done such a wonderful job of creating our own Garden of Eden. I call it our Garden of Eden here on campus. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. We're gonna make that happen. We're still waiting for renovations, so we have to be patient. It's worth it. It's worth it to allow all the students in the space in the future. So. Let's be patient as we wait for it. I, I say that, I'm saying that to myself because I wanted this done six months ago. So, uh, but I know it's worth it for everybody. Hey, thank you, Margaret. Hi. Hey again. Any nice comments? Nice to see you again. Uh, the comment that I wanted to say is that this presentation was wonderful. And the thing that I really like about this presentation that I don't often see when I do disability rights work is you guys are solution oriented. You're showing us where the inaccessibility problems are, and then you're showing us what the solutions are. Whereas uh, a lot of times when I do this work, uh, the disabled person will say, well, this happened to me and this happened to me, but they don't uh, tell the people around them how to fix it. And I'm really glad that the recreation classes are actually teaching the measurements of the ADA compliance, because I didn't learn that until much later in life, and, and uh, not even uh, some disabled people know that. And here you have like the whole class learning it regardless of whatever ability they have, and that, that's going to help them throughout their life, helping like with relatives or when, when they get an injury themselves, they know what they have a, a right to and, and like how things should be laid out and spaced out. That's wonderful. I'm so glad to see that that's happening. Good work. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I, I agree with Margo and wanted to thank you all, Professor Fearley and the, and the Rec Club for putting on this, uh, this wonderful presentation. And of course, Shannon, for all the work that you're doing with the garden and, and trying to make that space more accessible for, for more people. Um, and I want to thank the people who attended today for, for attending our, our second to last event. We've got one more coming today at three o'clock. Um, and that's going to be uh, an off-campus speaker, uh, Victoria Roldan Rodriguez, um, who's gonna be talking to us about intersectionality and disability and, and other marginalized identities. Um, so that should be an interesting talk. And I hope that folks can, uh, can sign up for that. I just put the, uh, the link to that session in the chat. So if anyone is interested, just press the link and you can register and I will see you at three o'clock. Um, this, this session really, uh, really complimented all of the sessions that we had uh, before today. And I especially love the student involvement and what you all are doing in the rec, in the rec program, you know, teaching people how to look for and how to create accessible spaces. So 
thank you very much. I hope that uh, to see some people at three o'clock and thank you very much again. <laughs> Thank you for a great week, Peter. Thank you for having me. Take care, everybody. Bye. Take care. Great job, Rec Club. Great job, Caroline. <laughs>